From body snatching to the mapping of the human genome. From the discovery of antibiotics to the first heart transplant. From the introduction of IVF to climate change and a pandemic. Through two world wars, nine monarchs, 56 prime ministers, the moon landing and the advent of the internet, the British Medical Association has witnessed the major political, clinical, social, cultural and technological milestones since it was formed almost 190 years ago. Our origins lie in the wood-panelled grandeur of the Worcester Royal Infirmary's boardroom. On 19th of July, 1832, a group of 50 doctors were invited by a local hospital physician, Charles Hastings, to set up an organisation, the Provincial Medical and Surgical Association, to try to counter the dominance of London in matters of medical practice. Established in the midst of a cholera outbreak, the new organisation's outlook was described as both friendly and scientific. Its chief aim was the advancement of medico-legal science via a forum that would allow provincial practitioners to exchange medical knowledge. However, after rebranding itself as the British Medical Association, or BMA, its leading figures quickly began to involve themselves in medical politics, representing the profession's views on healthcare and public policy to the governments of the day. We have subsequently remained at the core of national healthcare debates and have firmly established ourselves in the British public's mind as the voice of the medical profession. Total initial membership of the association was an impressive 310 and included doctors from as far afield as Swansea and Berwick-upon-Tweed. And, right from the start, our members were a mix of general practitioners, physicians and surgeons. The early prioritisation of regional debate and representation established a key ethos for the association that it still carries forth today. Ten years after our first gathering, BMA membership had reached nearly 1,500 and we were also well on the way to acquiring control of a weekly journal, the Provincial Medical and Surgical Journal, through which members could communicate. By 1857, this had become the British Medical Journal, which remains one of the world's foremost medical publications. Medicine in the 19th century was a very different world to the one we all understand today. In the 1830s, there was no clear line between the qualified doctor and the quack, or medical imposter. Very soon, we were at the forefront of campaigning for medical reform and regulation. It would not be until 1858 that the Medical Act provided some remedy. For the first time, it formally regulated who could legally practice medicine. Throughout the 19th century, we were an effective campaigner in many spheres, including around the poor law, medical practice, quackery, alternative medicine, public health, military medicine, and contract practice. The promotion of professional interests was one consideration, but protecting the public, for example, from the manufacturers of fraudulent, sometimes harmful, patent medicines, was another. In 1873, the first woman was elected as a member, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. She was also the first woman to qualify in Britain as a physician and surgeon. We continue to strive to ensure we represent the diverse membership of the BMA and the medical profession. In response to the outbreak of the First World War, the BMA put itself at the service of the government. It formed a central medical war committee and was given responsibility for managing the demand for doctors in the armed forces while maintaining a full medical service for civilians. As well as being central to the war effort from a healthcare perspective, numerous BMA members would go on to give their lives providing care on the front line during the conflict. By the time the BMA opened its current headquarters, near Euston Station, London, in 1925, the BMA was unquestionably the most authoritative voice of the medical profession in Britain. Our new home, BMA House, was designed by Edwin Lutyens and built on the site of one of Charles Dickens' former residences. Its opening ceremony was attended by King George V and Queen Mary. In 1932, we celebrated our 100th birthday with 100 branches, 250 divisions and a membership of 35,000 across all four nations. During this time, we also campaigned on issues such as the production and marketing of secret remedies, nutrition and physical fitness, the relationship of alcohol to road accidents and the medical aspects of abortion. The Central War Committee was set up on the outbreak of the Second World War to organise the conscription of doctors and coordinate local medical war committees. We worked with the Air Raid Precautions Department to train personnel for the defence of the civilian population. Unfortunately, 
the Air Raid Precautions Department could do little when war arrived on the BMA's own doorstep in April 1941, and BMA House is badly bombed during the Blitz. Early in the Second World War, it was widely recognized that arrangements for the provision of medical services to the British people were likely to change with the return of peace. And from this, the National Health Service, NHS, was born. Service began in 1948, while reform of the NHS starts almost immediately. The merits of the NHS were evident early on, and, as the century progressed, the BMA became one of its key advocates and protectors. During that same period, we played a key role in the formation of the World Medical Association. From an early stage during the Second World War, BMA House became a welcome space for doctors of all the Allied nations to congregate. They would meet up to discuss problems of medical practice and compare the conditions of medical service and medical education in their respective countries. From these unofficial meetings was born the idea to create an international medical organization to replace the Association Professionnelle Internationale des Médecins, APIM, which had suspended its activities because of the war. A conference was held in London in September 1946, to which medical associations from 31 countries were invited, and 29 of them sent representatives. An organizing committee was appointed and directed to draft a constitution. They also decided that the name of the new organization should be the World Medical Association. Their aim was for it to have broader activities and wider membership than the APIM. APIM officers graciously agreed to dissolve their organization and generously turned over its remaining funds to the WMA. Delegates at the conference also spoke with great feeling of the crimes committed by medical practitioners in their countries during the war. Action was called for to prevent any repetition of such conduct, and the BMA drew up a statement on war crimes in medicine, which was later adopted and published by the WMA. The WMA was officially founded on the 18th of September 1947, when physicians from 27 different countries met at the first General Assembly in Paris. The British Medical Association was very proud to be amongst the founding members. Right from its inception, the WMA was concerned over the state of medical ethics and worked on a modernized wording of the ancient oath of Hippocrates. The medical vow was adopted and the WMA agreed to name it the Declaration of Geneva. The WMA would go on to prepare an International Code of Medical Ethics, which after an extensive discussion was adopted in 1949 by the WMA's Third General Assembly. The BMA would play a full and committed role in the work of the WMA, and our relationship with the WMA has been one of mutual support and benefit. Like the BMA, the WMA also has a long history of speaking out on behalf of its members worldwide. It does so to protect healthcare-related human rights and the neutrality of physicians under threat by state actors. The BMA is the voice of the medical profession in the UK. As has become more evident than ever during the pandemic, health is interdependent and interconnected, and many of the issues of concern to the doctors the BMA represents are international in scope. Addressing them will require a coordinated and collaborative approach and a unified voice from the medical profession. Today, the scope of the BMA's work is as impressive as its influence. Our membership now stands at nearly 160,000. We represent the entirety of the profession, from medical students to those that are retired, and we encompass every type of doctor at every stage of their career. We ensure their voice is heard and continue to defend our members' terms and conditions. We campaign for positive change on the issues facing the medical workforce and the world of healthcare. We advise doctors in the UK on the legal and ethical issues they may encounter in their professional clinical practice. We offer learning and training to help doctors in their careers. We work with all the UK governments to improve healthcare policy to the benefit of all. We also support global health by campaigning on key issues of interest to the international medical profession, such as climate change, health inequalities and global cooperation, health information for all, fair medical trade and human rights. Throughout the pandemic, we have campaigned for protections for doctors fighting COVID-19 and been at the forefront of policy debate and central to the fight against this devastating disease. During an extraordinarily difficult period, we have tried to live up to our ideals, to look after doctors so they can look after their patients. As we look to the future, 
the importance of medical associations across the globe cannot be understated. Nor can the vital role the WMA plays in endeavouring to ensure the highest standards of medical ethics and healthcare are available to all. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, it is that the problems we face, we all face together. We hope that the cooperation and community that the WMA demonstrates throughout its fine organisation can serve as an example to all and lead to a better world for all.